Hello everybody and welcome along to the 10th Time for a Pint virtual get together. I am Chris Mann and I am joined today by my <laughs> co-host Matt the Watch Nerd. Hello Matt. Morning. Hello. Would you like to introduce one of our guests? I would. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Patrick Shergren. I still can't pronounce that name. I'm really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Excellent. Swedish, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Swedish watchmaker and half of GOS watches with um, uh, with uh, Johan Gustafsson. Um, Patrick, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Lovely to see you. You too. Uh, and along with Patrick, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Baruch Kutz, who is a fellow uh, London-based watch nerd, um, whiskey drinking chum, uh, blooming great guy, and fantastic watch photographer, as you will see from the 597 <laughs> that he's included in this week's, uh, this week's uh, deck. So welcome along, Baruch. Hello. <laughs> um, Hello. So, <laughs> I'm about to uh, start sharing um, my screen. We've got a presentation of all the pictures, uh, the pictures of the watches we're going to be talking about. Um, don't forget, you have got the chat function to talk amongst yourselves, and you can talk to us there. But if you have a question, please use the Q and A feature. It makes it a bit easier for us to keep an eye on those. Matt's going to be manning those. So if you have a question about one of the watches as we're talking about it, please ask it. And as the person whose watch it is has stopped talking, we'll ask the question. Uh, so should we get started? Let's dive into uh, the first watch, which is Patrick's. So just switch over as I'm sharing the screen. Can everybody yes. see the screen? Yeah, and it's uh, it's my Breitling Navitimer Cosmonaut. And um, it's not because I was uh, an avionics nerd in my teens nor that I did my master thesis at the aerodynamics department at Saab that I want to talk about this. But uh, the next picture will, will show why this uh, watch means a lot to me. Um, it was actually given to me uh, as a part of the Breitling scholarship. That's, that's from, my, uh, from the graduation day at the watchmaker school uh, some almost 15 years ago. Um, and um, it, it's about 30 minutes after I realized I was, um, had been picked as number one of, of that year's uh, students. Uh, so it was um, quite a victory for me being, um, becoming a watchmaker late in life. I actually had a life before uh, becoming a watchmaker and, and decided to really do something else. Uh, in parallel, actually, with, with my, my previous career as a, as a software developer in the, in the medical field. Um, so this was three years after I started at the watchmaker school. And I, despite having a, a family and house and, and not living in the, in the small town of the watchmaker school, I managed to, to, to be picked a, as number one. And the gift Besides the diploma was also a week in, in Switzerland. I got a week um, at Breitling to, to spend at, this, uh, at their um, teaching facilities. And I also got the watch you see there in the box, the Navita Navitimer Cosmonaut. Uh, and that's been with me uh, quite a lot on, on special occasions, but uh, Unfortunately, not so often nowadays. Uh, Chris, you can switch to the first image because now, now I'm going to talk about all, all the things you can do with the dial, all the calculations you can do. No, I'm not. <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I'm sad to say that I have not been able to, to learn any of the sliding ruler uh, things I, I'm I'm uh, I'm old, but I'm not old enough to have learned the, the, to use the sliding ruler <laughs> when I was in school. So and I, I still have that to to do. But I have the thing for 50s and 60s designs, and and the Navitimer. Uh, I, I believe the first Navitimer that it was announced on early 50s, maybe 52, 1952. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I think early '50s. So it has a lot of of what I enjoy uh, in design. But I've from from that time I've more delved into more clean 
design. So the, this dial is, is a bit cluttered, so to say. Uh, when compared with what I like nowadays, but but the being an, an aviation watch and also an astronaut watch, this this is. Um, I also believe that this is the first watch that was used by NASA astronauts, even before the, uh, the Omega. So this, this is the first one. I think it's a really cool watch. And um, if you switch to the next one, uh, I think you can see that Breitling put a lot of effort in, into, not of course every part, but also in, in the case. And that's something that appeals to me uh, because I, I follow the, the Swedish tradition of, of watchmaking, which is which means that I I enjoy working with, with the exterior of, of the watch, not only the movement. So I, I can really appreciate the, the amount of time they, they spend on making everything look as good as possible. And I think you can see on, is it possible to zoom in, Chris, or is it? No, unfortunately, no. no, no okay, but, but I, I think you can see how how the moose leather mirrors itself into the side of the case. That is quite a deep finishing. Uh, you can switch to the next one. Uh, one. One thing that perhaps is not completely to my taste, but if you look at our Sara collection, you, you will see the chamfer on the lugs. I actually, I realized that what I did for that case is quite similar to, to the Navitimer. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, it might be inspired from the chamfer you see here. But what, I can say a lot of the good things about the, the Breitling uh, polishing abilities, but I think this case could have been, um, made a little better uh, because if you look at the at the edges where the chamfer meets the the upper part of the lug it's a bit rounded and I, i've become since i do cases as well for for geos I, i've been become a finishing nerd as well and i would like i would have loved to see more uh, sharp uh, distinction between the two surfaces. But other than that, I think the, the polishing and the finishing overall is, is really, really, really good. And the next picture will show that this particular model has, does not have the original movement, the, the Venus caliber, but rather the, the one with the chronograph module. And you can tell that by uh, comparing the level of the push buttons and the winding crown. You see that the push buttons are higher towards the <laughs> dial. And that means that that's a quick way to see if, if, uh, if a Navitimer has a, a module, chronograph module or um, the old or new movement. This was actually uh, a movement. I, I was uh, one of the movements I, I was um, taught how to, how to service when I was in Brooklyn. So I wore this the, during the week uh, in Gretchen and uh, I was taught how to service my own watch properly. <laughs> I think we'll see the next picture will show the backside. And this is actually something that's quite easy to, to learn. You see the grays, circular lines. It took a while for me to realize because first I only saw the numbers. What, what, what is this? And then I realized that this is a, a conversion table between Celsius degrees and Fahrenheit. <laughs> Quite useful, especially when you're talking temperatures with, the, with Americans. Um, I have never learned to do that on the fly, but having this watch, it's, it's easy. <laughs> and I also took a picture on the, um, in my own dark room, the, where I try out the loom. If you switch, no, okay. Um, okay, the buckle, of course. This is my, 
I think this is my first proper premium watch and I was really impressed with the detail, the attention to detail and the buckle is, is one, one of those really solid stainless steel with deep engraving or I think it might be pressed but still very good uh, finishing and uh, attention to detail. <coughs> So the next one is, is the Loom Shop. I have it just outside my, my workshop here. So this is where I test the Loom on, on our watches. So I decided to try out the, the Navi Time. I hadn't done this before, uh, but I think it's pretty good. What do you say? It glows really nicely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, really nice. Um, I think so. Is this the, you have another watch? So spoiler yeah. alert: Patrick has another watch. But I think this is the last picture of this one. Yeah. So any questions from anybody about this in particular? We we had a comment from <clears throat> from Jimmy who said that Scott Carpenter used his own Breitling um, before, obviously before the Speedmasters went into space. So so a, another space nerd little uh, little anecdote there on SpaceX NASA Day, which is good. Oh yeah. Um, Kathleen's also given us the, the maths to convert Fahrenheit, which I think is some ancient Babylonian or Assyrian kind of scale uh, into Celsius. Um, but uh, I must admit my, my knowledge of ancient <laughs> Babylonian is, uh, is not good, so maybe we'll leave that one. Um, Rochelle pointing out that private watches went in certified and private is a distinction. Yeah, obviously um, until, until certification, anything that went into space was was a was a, a private object but um yeah good um one question from james patrick do you happen to know how the modern b01 caliber compares to the etta with the depress oh uh, unfortunately I, I have no i haven't had the pleasure to 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 have that to compare. No, i haven't i haven't been able to see the back of one either but it's uh, um it's it's integrated yeah column wheel, i think yeah it looks really nice. That that's I can't say, but I, I think we would agree, everyone on that. But um, I can also say that I know a lot of people dislike the the module chronograph module versions, but uh, having worked on it, I, I can see I can say that it's quite solid, and, and it works really really nicely. Um, no but of course, of course, uh, uh, an integrated movement is, is a, a step higher. But some people um, really dislike the the modules, but they have done a really good job on this one. I can tell you. Yeah. That. It seems to be uh, it seems to be like an internet watch forum thing to hate modular. Yeah. <laughs> and I I think it comes from people have taken them to watchmakers who haven't been trained on how to yeah. work. And then the watchmaker goes, "Well, this is junk. It's not even worth <laughs> Um, and, well, well, and then that becomes the story, and it's not yeah. true, I don't think. No. Well, the first thing you see when you open the case back is uh, 2892, uh, uh, Breitling version. So maybe that's uh, a put off because it's, it's, it's an ETA, but it, it's a Breitling version, of, of course, and the uh, chronometer uh, certified. So it's, it's a really good base caliber with an even better module. Hmm. Yeah, it just shows you people on the internet, they know nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, some, some do. <laughs> um, okay, so should we take a look at the yeah. next one? Okay, yeah. so I got these pictures the day before yesterday and I've spent a good amount of time looking at them and uh, I'm gonna let you talk about it because I know nothing and I'm just intrigued. <laughs> okay, so I, I can begin to say that um, this is um, a watch we introduced during autumn to 2019. And it's the first proper gold watch we made. And um, 2018, we made a, a bronze watch, old bronze and Damascus steel. And when doing that, I, I realized, wait a minute, I, I, I can do bronze cases, of course, I, I can do gold cases. So um, boldly, I, I went ahead made a new design and, and um, started to, to um, think about how to make it come to reality. But in the end, 
it's made completely differently. It, it's a collaboration with, with a goldsmith and we, the gold is cast. Uh, but it's still made, the case is made totally in-house here in the GOS workshop, only in shopping with, because we collaborate with the goldsmith nearby. So we see a photo of it. <laughs> yeah. So here's the yeah. side. What do you say, Matt? I can't actually see it. Why oh. can't I see it? I can see it. Cool. I can see it uh, now. Thank you. Okay, so this is all black Damascus, and the black Damascus is something I developed for, for the only watch project we made with the singer uh, reimagined for last year. And this is the first watch with, with the Black Damascus. Uh, and of course, the Swedish red gold nuance. And what you see here in the crown, the crown is hand sculpted, also Damascus steel. And it has a really large um, blue sapphire inset. So not only did we, the, the first, at the first time, collaborate with a goldsmith, we also had jewels inset properly. Uh, if you look at the second picture, I think uh, you'll see the dial. Oh, but you won't see the, the indexes, but you can see the hands. Uh, those are made by, by me uh, from thin sheets of um, Johann Gustafsson's hand-forged uh, pattern welded steel. And they are made uh, and finished in, this, in the same technique I've, I've done for, for the last years uh, with very deep chamfer. And polished and um, we tweeted to get maximum contrast of the Damascus steel while maintaining the the luster of, of the facets and this photo shows a bit of, of the loom from the dial the dial is is uh, made of white mother of pearl that has a, that is backlit and also colored by modern superluminova in a, in a blue color and uh, I developed that for also last year uh, for a Sara Glacier um, and it worked really well and I wanted to have a different I wanted to use Damascus steel in, in, a, in a different way for this model but also since we we decided to to make the watch uh, in honor of the Viking winter goddess I think it felt very appropriate to have a glacier blue dial. Please tell me if I need to speed up or I, I'm not sure of the time. If we switch to the next one, that's the type of photo uh, I always take when, when a watch is first assembled in the GOS workshop. I, I go to the workshop window and I take a couple of photos for, for documentation. And here you see the dial and also the black Damascus. And you also get a glimpse of, of the engraving on the lugs. Uh, the engraving is, is done by the same uh, master engraver who did the, uh, the engraving for Sarek Trollius, a uh, uh, fully engraved watch. I, I think the, the red gold and, and the blue, uh, black Damascus works really well together. Okay, next one, please. And that's uh, the Damascus steel movements we made. We made Damascus steel movements for, for almost 10 years now. Uh, at least the report, prototype well, I, I made 10 years ago, just to make sure it was possible to, to fit jewels directly in, in Damascus steel. Uh, but this is the first one, which also features engraving, also done by Anders Hedlund master knife maker and engraver. And here we see Scotty, number one of five. And also the first time I, I got to use our own uh, precious metal stamping. Uh, our, our stamp is GS. It's difficult to see, but it's in the bottom there, just next, next to 18K. And also you see the Viking loop engraving. Like a hallmark. Yeah. GS is our hallmark for, for, for the precious metal cases. Do you, do you have official, oh, actually Seth has just asked the same question. Is there an official Swedish um, hallmarking yeah. assay office? Yeah. yeah, 
I could not get GOS, unfortunately. It was taken. No. But G G GS is, is close enough. GS is close enough. <laughs> Beautiful. I love the I love the inlaid gold as well against yeah, the um, Damascus. And really, that, yeah. that's one of, one of Anders' uh, specialities is gold inlays. That's beautiful. Thank you. So, so most of the comments most of the comments are um, superlatives. Uh, oh. it looks incredible, says Marcus. Beautiful, Kathleen. John Cook. Wow, amazing. Oh, uh, thank you. Perth. Perth says it looks like something a Russian assassin would use because it's so sharp. <laughs> um, and that then got onto some discussion about ninja Vikings, which I think might be a thing. I'm not sure. Maybe. They do no, uh, that, that's Triskele symbol is, is our version of uh, um, um, a Viking three-legged symbol that's uh, symbolized Odin. The god Odin. So he, uh, there are different. Both Celts and Vikings had three-legged symbols, and that's that's yeah. our version of something that um, it was meant to to illustrate Odin's three drinking horns, and that that's our version of the, of the Viking symbol. And we use that for for second hands, for rotors, for decoration. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, a quick question about the black Damascus. What what metals are used in that? That's stainless Damascus steel. We use stainless Damascus steel for all the exterior parts, and and we uh, we collaborated with a local um, surface treatment facility, uh, who has uh, we we took together we developed a super black PVD, uh, and uh, we used that feature to to get the most contrasts. Normally when you cover Damascus steel with something with a single color, you lose all contrast. But uh, we, we have been able to retain if you move back to some of the previous um, you can see that there's still a lot of contrast. You can see the, the pattern quite well, even though it is all black. And it's done by a company who normally do surface coating for uh, for industries, for um, shipping parts, uh, ship parts. I mean, and hmm. so it's really, really tough. It's really well, cool. Well, it, yeah, and it's also a local company here in Linköping. Of course, um, Anders is local as well, isn't he? So that's that's good. Pardon? Anders is, Anders Headland is local as well, I think. Yeah, he's, he's Swedish, yeah. but he's, he's on the West Coast. Oh, is that, okay, fine. Very good. Right. Uh, there are no more questions at the moment, I don't think. Shall we, should yeah. we say thank you and move on? Yes. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so now on to the 579 picture photo lecture from uh, Baruch. Uh, hope everyone's got a drink. I'm kidding. <sighs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just concerned I've got to follow Ninja Vikings now. It's a bit unfair. You're going to be fine. I've seen your pictures. <laughs> okay. Over cool. to you, sir. Okay. So if you look at the first image, uh, you will see the little 6V159 sitting on the left-hand side, the second in from the left next to a Steimer WWW. This array of watches uh, doesn't actually belong to me or my friend Johnny anymore. Uh, it was a collection of watches that we put together in the space of about uh, five months at the end of uh, 2015 and beginning of 2016. Uh, when we became both quite obsessed with military watches. Uh, and this was some time after I'd bought my first uh, military-inspired watch, which was a modern CWC, a mechanical version of the general service watch, which obviously wouldn't have been issued. They issued the quartz watches. Um, so I came back to military watches about 2015, and we put this together. We had, although they're not all there on the screen, we had nine of the dirty dozen before we decided we needed to liquidate, uh, because at the time I was uh, project managing a um, construction project at his house, and he needed cash. Uh, and I probably ran out of money because uh, I was working in construction. But I managed to keep uh, the Ebel. Uh, the main reason why I kept the Ebel is because when I first bought it, I had absolutely no idea what it was, um, any history about it. I bought it from a dealer in uh, Spitalfields Market, um, Nikki. I'm sure quite a few people who know military watches know of her. And um, 
I couldn't get reception on my phone to do any research, so I bought it. Um, the 6B159 uh, is probably better known as uh, the original version anyway, the Mark 7A, which is the Weems, which with the rotatable bezel. Um, you might have noticed uh, Tom Hardy wearing one uh, in the film Dunkirk. We can actually scroll to the next picture so we can see. You can watch a bit closer up. Um, and uh, this watch was uh, commissioned uh, by goldsmiths and silversmiths uh, for British airmen. Um, at the time, as was the case with any belligerent during the war, it was, wasn't straightforward getting hold of Swiss watches. The Swiss couldn't really supply to anyone uh, overtly, so it was all done through proxies. Um, this is marked 6B234 on the back, but we'll get onto that later. You can scroll through. So it's a three-piece steel case. Um, this version being the second iteration, the first version being issued in 1940 in a chrome case, which was made by Denison with a steel back. Um, it's quite a small watch. It's 31 and a half mil in diameter, 39 lug to lug, um, but it has quite a presence on the wrist. It uh, sits 10 mil off the wrist with a flat top crystal and the, the uh, crown itself is six and a half mil. Uh, which obviously makes it very practical for a pilot. Uh, you can scroll through to the next image, Chris. Thank you. And uh, as you can see, unusually, it has uh, curved fixed bars, which are about 1.1 millimeter in thickness. And these are quite fortunate to have retained their shape over the last 78 years. Um, uh, the dial itself uh, has very bold typography to make it very legible. Uh, most of the 6B159s were uh, silver dialed. Um, and there's a few from uh, Longines, I think from uh, Le Coutre, that had uh, black dials with uh, luminous hands, but most of them had white dials. Um, and if you scroll through again, you can see that the uh, chapter ring being two-toned, probably, and someone might be able to correct me on it, I think it might be an enamel chapter ring. That's what it looks like to me. It's got very fine hairline cracks in it. Um, and the watch, as you can see, has the characteristic spotting of a non-waterproof watch that's allowed a bit of moisture in. Um, and now this spotting has become a very, very strong selling point for Fogina style watches. Yes, I wasn't going to mention names, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry, mate. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, it's obvious. Everyone knows, I think. Um, if you scroll through to the next picture, uh, it did occur to me very recently that the, uh, the 2 and the 12 and the 2 were different sized, maybe perhaps to make the 12 uh, a dominant number on the dial. And I check this and the two at two o'clock is 5% uh, smaller. So I'm not sure that I actually did see that. that might be my imagination. Uh, if you scroll through to the next picture, you just get a better idea of the two-tone chapter ring and the size of the crown against the case. Um, and this uh, on the next image uh, is a very good example of what I think must be an original crystal. Uh, I have a theory that a lot of military watches probably would have had a flat top crystal to avoid uh, distortion at the edges. Uh, I had a Vertex WWW which had a flat top crystal and again even though it was a, a black dialed watch um, you uh, had very very good visual of the hands and this is a, a really acute angle that I took the photo at just to show you how good that visual still is um, which I suspect was probably quite an important point uh, being an M and trying to read the time and the seconds quite clearly. Um, and also, if this watch catches the moonlight um, at night, it's it's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good in terms of uh, visual readability as well. Um, let's move on to the next image. Um, you can probably just about tell that the hands aren't their original colour. Um, most 6B159s I've always read have blued hands, um, and I think it's probably just about visible in the hour hand that that's not quite black. Um, it looks like uh, it has a blue tinge to it. Uh, it might be that I need to have those hands cleaned at some point. Uh, but this is one of the, this, this image uh, for me at least aesthetically definitely displays uh, what most people would say would be the Calatrava style profile with the downturn lugs, um, which may be one of the most attractive profiles of a watch, especially with the, the brushed steel case. Um, move through to the next picture. Uh, it gives us a better idea of the proportions as well. That mid case is about four mil and that crown really is very prominent. Uh, I've seen of quite a few that have much smaller crowns and it simply doesn't make any sense why a watch uh, that there was this small would have such a small crown being used by pilots. Um, 
and number and the next sorry the next image will show you again uh, the proportions of the crown against the side of the case. Um, if we scroll through to the next image, just a, a note on the uh, finishing of the case. Uh, I suppose that um, if a pilot was was lucky enough to uh, survive um, through however many sorties uh, he would have uh, partaken of, uh, the watch would probably survive as well, like an infantry or a field watch, which probably would have taken a battering. So amazingly, this watch seems to have survived in its original condition. Uh, you can see a uh, tiny little dent at the bottom of the lug there, which probably suggests that um, either he hit it against something or more, like, more than likely I probably hit it against something. But it's quite prominent um, and that, that junction between the top of the lug and the side of the lug is exceptionally sharp. Um, and uh, the, f the finish of the watch is evident because, as I've been reading recently, the case is made of stay bright steel rather than uh, stainless steel. Um, stay bright being uh, much easier to finish or to cold work. Um, if we go through to the next image, uh, it gives you a better idea of some of the fine, fine details. This was taken with uh, a reverse mounted lens, so it's about, I think it's about three and a half, four times magnification. But it gives you an idea of how fine that finishing is on the case, which is interesting because at the beginning I was talking about how urgent it was that watch cases uh, were made as quickly as possible um, and yet at the same time some of these cases seem to have been finished to a uh, very high standard. Um, I will get back to the finishing of the case later on though. Um, and if we go to the next image, again as I mentioned before the distortion at the edge of the crystal would have been prevented not only by the shape of the crystal but also by the fact that the hands are curved. Um, at the outer edges. The minute hand, when you look at it straight on, looks like it literally is scraping across the dial. Um, so I'm happy I took this photo just to make sure that it wasn't doing that. Um, and the hand seemed to have survived pretty well and the, the counterpoise has got uh, a good length to it. Now we'll go on to the movement. Uh, as is the case with most of these watches, they uh, borrowed movements from all over the place and Abel uh, used the uh, A-Shield uh, 1158. Uh, this is the 101. Uh, Chris and I had a conversation about whether these were recased 1940 issues. Uh, they are not because the original one used a caliber 99, which was based on a completely different movement. Uh, so these were definitely cased, um, especially. Um, they're pretty, pretty well finished movements considering that they were uh, manufactured at pace to meet the demands of the air ministry. Uh, it's got a breguet overcoil and a screw balance. Um, and if I may quote from uh, PVH Weems, a lieutenant commander, about the accuracy of watches, he says that moderately priced navigation watches are guaranteed by the manufacturers not to change rates more than two to three seconds per day. Therefore, one of these watches set by radio daily should be within two seconds of the correct time throughout the day and nearly always within one second which to be frank with you sounds like it would be an amazing uh, timekeeping accuracy nowadays. Yeah. I'm, not sure, I'm, not sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure where he got his figures from, but I believe him because he's a lieutenant commander. Optimistic, optimistic. Very optimistic, I think <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so we're gonna move on now to the markings, which I think are probably the most interesting thing about the watch, at least uh, in my opinion. So you've got the Air Ministry, you've got 6B, um, uh, 6B159, and you can see on the top right-hand corner, the close-up, you can see the 159 having been milled out. These aren't engraved, uh, they're milled. Um, and the 234 at the bottom right, obviously replacing that. So what would happen was that the watch would go in for chronometric testing. And if it didn't come back and meet uh, the, the, the Weems standard of accuracy, then it would have been downgraded. Um, would have been downgraded to uh, probably general service, so maybe even for staff on the ground to be uh, to be used for them rather than uh, given back to pilots and navigators, or it was considered to be a substitute watch uh, for them. Um, 862 just would, would be the uh, issue number, and 42 obviously the year it was uh, issued. Uh, we can go to the next image. Um, now this number that sits underneath the case back at the top left corner is interesting to me because this is probably the beginning of the most fascinating part of my investigation into this watch. Others might not find it as much, but that is a very unusual positioning for a matching number. If you look at any of the WWW watches, or if you look at an, uh, 
Marie Nationale Longines, for example, or any Longines um, from that sort of period, 30s, 40s, or 50s, you'll find uh, a case back number probably engraved on the outside, and then a number on one of the lugs uh, that would be matching. This was a way of definitely for a collector anyway to verify. A lot of WW watches, other military watches had them swapped around during servicing. But this is this is a uh, this is a matching number. And if we go to the next picture, um, we can see that number, which seems to have a slightly heavier engraving. Uh, Asia Stay Bright being the metal, uh, obviously, and um, and then that number nine one zero one zero zero one is a number that appears on every single other six B one five nine from 1942 that I've seen. Uh, there's only one other number that sits close to it um, that has any relevance because I don't know what that number means. Um, and that's for the 6B542, which for most people would know as the uh, Thin Arrow Omega from 1953, which has a, uh, another designation, which is 6B910-1000. So there must be some connection. It's just interesting to how they are descending numbers um, as they become younger in age. So. At this point, I'm thinking, who made this case? Uh, a lot of the records obviously would have been lost um, at this point. Um, I've, been, I've, I've tried to be in touch with uh, the grandson of the founder of Ebel, who happens to be director of a Swiss private bank. I'm waiting to hear back from to see if uh, his, his archives or his family's archives exist. Um, but I got in touch with uh, Ziggy Veselovsky, who wrote this book. That I'm holding up, which is the uh, military timepieces. And obviously, I got in touch with Conrad Knierim, who wrote the big book on British military watches. Uh, Ziggy reiterated what I'd read on forums that it was just a rarer issue, reissue of, uh, 19, of a 1942 watch. I emailed Conrad whilst I was sitting on a beach in Mombasa, who emailed me back and said, Welcome from, uh, he said, uh, Greetings from Thailand. And he then gave me pretty much the same information, but he got back to me pretty quick. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't give me any information. Uh, Ziggy only mentions it briefly in his book. Uh, Conrad doesn't even include an image of uh, a 6B234 at all. Uh, so at this point, I'm thinking to myself, right, so the markings on the case, if we move to the next picture. So this is, these are two Denison cases. One on the left is, I think, the Zenith. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got a reference to the people who own these pictures. Uh, and the second one on is, is, a, is a first, um, the first issue of the Abel. And you can see again the different movement and different case. But now the case is marked Denison, um, and it's one two two three two. Now the the, the matching the matching uh, number can be seen, but this can be seen in the top right hand corner rather than the top left hand corner. So. That sort of threw me off the center a bit because I thought to myself, first of all, it's in the wrong corner. And second of all, uh, why would a Denison case be signed ACA Staybright? All of them are signed Dennis Steel or just Denison and Stainless Steel. Um, so I'm not completely convinced that they were, these were sort of made in a hurry and then, uh, and then sent off to Ebel and then sent back again to uh, the United Kingdom. So I decided to spend quite a lot of time looking at stainless steel cases from other makers. So if we go through to the next picture. This is a very, very lovely uh, vintage Patek Philippe 570. It has the characteristic Calatrava case because pretty much the Calatrava case belongs to Patek Philippe. Um, it has uh, those lovely downturned lugs. It has a very similar profile in the lug, which looks like a fish head. Um, but what you'll notice is in the top two pictures, uh, you'll see that there has the vertical striping of the machine marks in between the lugs, as does the Ebel. And more interestingly is on the outer flange of the case back, you'll see also that, that pitting in the case. Now, I haven't seen uh, any evidence that this watch has any uh, secondary markings to have matching numbers, but it was my first indication that perhaps these cases were made by a manufacturer manufacturing for many other people who happen to have some left over. The only oddity is that this is a 31 and a half mil case and most cases that were designed in this fashion uh, would be 35 mil and upwards. If we look at the next picture, we'll see again, um, another similar case. It's um, an Eberhard, very similar profile. Numbers are in a similar position, but they are oriented correctly rather than one on top of the other. Uh, the Stay Bright case um, is another indicator that they might be from the same manufacturer. And if we look at the last image, um, sorry, the second to last image, um, again, this is a Vacheron Constantine. Now, this is in the same position 
as the Denison um, markings, but they are correctly placed one above the other. Um, and if we look at the final image, which is of a Vacheron chronograph, uh, I think this is a 4217, or no, it's a 4072. Um, again, it has the uh, correct markings on the left, but also has extra markings on the right-hand side, but it's a stay bright case. Um, it has a, a similar profile um, that I haven't included here. So at the moment, I am in the position where, for some reason, I'm completely obsessed with finding out who made these cases. Uh, it might seem unimportant, and it probably is, but I think what's key to this particular watch for me is that um, they might sound um, perhaps slightly overblown, but it's quite an, un an unusual thing to wear a watch worn in the Second World War that probably saw numerous battles and is still in such good condition and I can still wear it, it functions perfectly. And that's the main reason why I find it such a special watch. Obviously, on the flip side, being a person who's obsessed with watches, um, I can't help but try and discover uh, something further about this particular timepiece. And if you take a look at the last image, um, I thought it was best to show a naked shot of it because it doesn't really need a strap. It's a beautiful timepiece. Um, it would have been um, used for incredibly important activities during the Second World War. Um, and I find it to be a, a lovely piece of uh, watchmaking history from that period. Thank you. Thank you. And any questions from anybody? Um, there was a question. There was a question typed in about uh, stay, stay bright, bright and what exactly uh, it is. So yeah, yeah so yeah, that's the, Kathleen's correct. That is, is, that is correct, exact. Yeah. Kathleen's correct. That's the best place to look. I mean, stay bright is essentially um, a, a, a stainless steel that was um, created by um, a mill in uh, the north of England. I think Firth Steels. It's 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 still the the copy the trademark still belongs to a Swiss company now. Um, but it was easier, like I said, to uh, cold work, but at the same time, it, it didn't have as good a corrosion resistance as you would get from 316 or 304. Yeah. But as you can see from the unbelievably fine finish uh, on the uh, brushed uh, case band, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And they, you, can, you can tell actually, now that I've looked a bit more into Staybrite, you can tell the difference between stainless steel and Staybrite. I mean, Staybrite does glow when you see a vintage Staybrite watch, it has a certain yeah. glow to it. This hand's incredible. They're very lovely. I'm sure I can get someone um, maybe to clean them up because I'm, I'm pretty convinced now they probably are blue underneath. I just think they've tarnished. I love how, how nicely the whole thing fits together. So seeing it without the bezel and the, and the crystal on, it, the, the curved um, bars are kind of even more pronounced. It almost looks like it could, mm. could have been a larger watch and it's just been shrunk. All the other bits have been shaved off until what's left is, is the case as it is. You know, like almost if it was a great big piece of circular steel and someone's hewn it out of that it does look like that it's really it's unbelievably solid i mean you compare it to a chromed version of any 6b159 you see a profile of a longine for example the one that the uh, the reissue is based on i mean it look it just it looked like completely different watches it's interesting how the you know originally they were trying to make cheap watches and make them quickly and then for some reason in 1942 a whole batch of these came out movado made one as well that's even rarer than this um that was also made in a steel case so it's it's a bit of a mystery it's a good one to keep tracking down, though. It's keeping you busy, which... Oh, I yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I and love if, a bit of lockdown there, research. <laughs> exactly. And if, there are any, if there's anyone on the, um, on the chat today or anyone who watches this on YouTube afterwards who has any information, um, if they could get in touch with them, um, that would be amazing because I'm sure you know, maybe, maybe someone's done some, some work on this as well. So Maybe. Always good to reach out to fellow watch nerds to help. That would be great. Absolutely. Um, cool. Sweet, where did um, one, one quick question? Um, cool. uh, where did you get the Weems book from? <laughs> oh, I bought the Weems. <laughs> I bought the Weems book on eBay. I um, bought it from these guys, Cambridge Rare Books Limited. They had a copy. They might have another one. Worth trying. Very good. Thank you. There we are. Um, so on to the third watch for the afternoon, which is Matt's. So over to you, sir. So I'm I'm lucky. Uh, that I get to see these watches or hear which watches people are going to talk about before you do. So I'm able to sometimes tailor my watch. And in this instance, I haven't, obviously. Um, because this isn't, this isn't a chronometer. Uh, sorry, this is a chronometer. It's certainly not a chronograph and it's not military. Um, but, but maybe, maybe there's just a little bit of similarity between Patrick's 
uh, lovely brightling and um, and the able but we'll see so uh, if we could flip onto the first slide i first met um, peter back in 2010 when he was late to his own get together um, he was flying in from he was flying in from geneva it was a, a get together arranged by the purists um, uh, greg who's sometimes on the on, on the call um, had arranged it i think along with uh, mo and people sid may even remember it um, but um, yeah, he, he got stuck because of snow, I think. And, and by the time that he arrived, there were only about six of us left. So we had dinner in the, the middle of the restaurant and, and chatted. Uh, this photo was taken in 2011 when he did a, a gig with, um, with Bremont actually, uh, arranged by Al at ATG Vintage. Next slide. So this watch um, is the, one of the Momentum Mori's that uh, they, he, he was developing at the time. And that classic case, I think, kind of encapsulates uh, a lot of Peter's kind of original design DNA. And the next picture is one of the one in twenties, um, which was a, uh, which is upside down. <laughs> <laughs> it's the wrong way up. Uh, one in twenty, obviously, um, uh, which is a it's a, 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 a QP, but um, a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, watch that was um, that was released back in the in the mid two thousands and um, very successful for. Um, for, for Peter. Um, but the watch I've been waiting to buy since about 2010 was the, um, ah, this one. <laughs> was oh. this one. <laughs> so, well, well, hold on. so this is it. So exactly. So the watch I've been waiting to buy, uh, which shares all of the design, uh, design language and history from, um, from Peter's original uh, uh, pocket watch, I was going to get to this, um, is, the, is the Serpent Calendar. Um, the Serpent Calendar being a, a, an indicator of, 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 the, um, of the date uh, and unusually um, thick indicator as well with the hands there. Um, you can see it's almost the same width as, um, as the minute hand there. Um, unlike in early pocket watches that first used this as a, as, a, as a calendar indicator when they were usually quite fine and quite often had more wiggles to them. Um, the reason I had the pocket watch in there, which is one of uh, the, um, or is Peter's pocket watch from his, um, his uh, uh, first days at, at school, um, is because you can see that this language through the 2000s as he launched his brand continued into this Piccadilly case and into the hands um, with that big spade hand, which is shared by the able, um, and uh, the, the very fine second hand, similar to the able, and the the strange kind of waist to the minute hand. Um, so this is effectively an ETA uh, 2892, similar to Patrick's Breitling, um, I think. Um, yeah. With, uh, with the old school date pusher up at the top left. So instead of pulling out the crown uh, to the second position and winding the date on, it's actually been reverse engineered to be uh, like the you know, the, the, the pushes from the 40s, 50s, etc. when you actually have to take a toothpick or something sharp and, and, and stick it in the top. So if we go on um, this blurry picture, which looked so much better on my phone. Oh, it's filthy as well. Right, next picture. Uh, <laughs> it was just showing the hands anyway, and you've seen the hands. You've seen the hands. Uh, it shows that big crown, which um, strangely is the kind of thing you get in um, airman's watches um, quite often was it IWC that had that yeah. and maybe some probably lacquer German lacquer lacquer yeah. yeah. um, makers had that uh, oh I don't know what you call it what is that shape conical What's the, do they call it conical crown right. no I just made yeah. that up but it sounds good I can't believe there's no word for it anyway so that funnily shape uh, <laughs> which which makes it obviously very easy to pull on which is grand um, but yeah, so so I love this. Um, the next page will show. You, so the next slide will show the the lugs. Very again, very similar to um, uh, to all that Piccadilly case. Very straight on. Uh, big screws going through so, you know, to to untighten the, uh, the the strap, um, and a slightly strange notch out of the top. Um, apparently, allegedly, that was a mistake he first made when he was polishing one of the lugs and took too much out of it and really liked it and kept it in. But I'm not sure. <laughs> That might be anecdotal, so don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> luckily, luckily, these things aren't recorded, so no one will ever know. <laughs> you have to polish really hard to remove that much. Material. Yeah, but you know, he trained in Hackney, so he's a hard boy. Right. <laughs> uh, 
so as I said, I've been waiting to buy one of these since 2010, and I finally got, got one um, four, four years ago, maybe, um, from what is now a collected man, but in those days, no, sorry, what is now? Yeah, now a collected man. Now a collected man, but whatever Silas's place was before. Yeah. Um, and it's got the enamel dial, um, the, the blued hands, um, the beautiful blue track, I think, uh, on the enamel dial. Uh, there is some, there's some slight undulation to that. It's not perfectly, perfectly flat. And that one sole blue screw um, down at six o'clock, which before we had a kind of logo, was an unofficial logo in a way. There was this blue screw it doesn't actually do anything. It's not functional. But um, you put that, those screws in, um, I think, as a kind of little design, design thing, um, which I rather like. Um, Rich has pointed out that it's sometimes called a diamond crown as well. Um, if we final, is that the final picture? Oh, no, of course. So it's a 2892 um, Etta um, with, uh, with some slight tweaking, obviously, um, and a completely new back plate. So you can see it's, um, it's, in, it's, in, it's in that brass uh, with, um, with a radial finish. Um, and a nice link back to Vikings, Norse mythology, and uh, even the Isle of Man. Uh, the topping tool um, kind of design that Peter used in, um, yeah. in many of his watches echoes echoes that three-legged and three three-horned skeleton. So yeah, I think I did quite a good job there fitting all together. Yeah. Uh, the next picture shows some of the finishing, and one of the reasons I love these is and ignore the case because I sh really should have cleaned that better. But the finishing on the on the the, the automatic rotor there is, right. is rather pretty. Um, I do like those you know those internal edges and they're, they're quite sharp there. They're nicely done for a for an etta. Um, you know, lots of people aren't aren't keen on people taking what do they call them? workhorse movements, I suppose. Um, but uh, they're not keen on taking them and, and turning them into something pretty. But as as we've seen, you know, it's a, it's incredible what you can do with them in the right hands. And, and I think when Speed Marin was in Peter's hands, he did some amazing things. So that's me. Are there any questions? Any questions? No questions. I've stunned people into silence again. I like it. I think it's cool. I think uh, the, you were wearing this watch, I think, when we first met. <clears throat> I think you talked about it when, in the very, very early days of the podcast when we got together to talk about your watches. Probably. Really. I think so. Um, I thought it was cool then. I still think it's cool now. Um, yeah. yeah. It has a lot of presence on the wrist, this thing. It's, this is a chunky it's watch. It's big. Yeah. It's a chunky watch. I mean, Stuart's point, Stuart says he likes the Mark II um, cases, and they're, 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 much, they're much thinner. They're far easier to wear. You know, with the screws that come out of the lugs at the side, um, you can imagine it's, uh, it's one of the ones that will catch on a, on a jacket quite, quite quickly. Um, Perth says he likes the speak Marion, but they've got a very dis so he never liked them, but the Greeks <laughs> have got a very distinctive design language. Sorry, Perth. Uh, we don't have to like everything. I mean, I don't like Perth. I prefer Sydney. Um, <laughs> He's got a very distinctive no, that's design so language. Harsh. Yeah. Uh, is the pattern on the back part of the rotor or the case back? So that is the rotor. The, the triscalion is the three arms going out to the to what you can see is a basically hidden weight underneath the big big mass that, that's spinning. Exactly. Around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love it's nicely done when you. Yeah, when you give it a, a wiggle, it spins around nicely. So there we are. Thank you very much. So, something I'm enjoying quite a lot is is as we're seeing, and like we, we've been very fortunate to have some some wonderful independent watchmakers uh, join us for these Sunday drink and watch sessions, uh, including Patrick. Um, and whenever you see anything from an independent, they don't look <laughs> like watches in the mainstream. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I, don't, I don't think any of the independent makers are making things that could be mistaken for something that's in the you know kind of in the you could walk into a, a high street jewelers and buy something off the peg they're all very different they all have their own language um and i think that's really interesting you know it's it, it the personality of the watchmakers are going into it rather than um i guess the design ethos of a brand which is what you'd expect from kind of the big established brands who make hundreds of thousands of watches if not millions a year um so yeah i think it's cool thanks for sharing that um, I am going to round out today's um, session of um, watches with another 1940s watch. So this is an Omega CK2165, and then the kind of extra bit of this is a CSI. 
which doesn't stand for crime scene investigation it stands for the civil service of india um, or so the rumor goes so this is the watch uh, it's filthy um and <laughs> you you may have seen these pictures before because i put them on instagram when i bought it the watch is with um james harris at harris horology at the moment i bought it knowing it had got a broken balance staff i didn't know how hard it would be to get the correct balance staff because uh, there are multiple iterations of the 265 movement that is fitted to this. Uh, it's a 30 mil case, again, with a great big crown. So this is, this is a, a watch designed for, for men. It's a hand winding, um, kind of a 26.5 or 26,5, which is a 15 joule, 1800 BHP movement. Um, it looks like this, which I think is quite nice. Um, you can see more evidence of the uh, wonderful condition this watch has been kept in. Um, I assume this sort of weird wrist cheese is protecting the case, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that will. Uh, I'm really. I, if James is with us today, I'm really sorry, James. I didn't mean to hand it over in this condition. Um, I should have given it a wipe down. Uh, but you know, that's real wrist cheese or something. I don't know. Um, so th this is the movement, as as you can see. Uh, it's it's been set to um, run a little bit faster. I think there was something wedged in there to try and hold the balance staff together, because uh, I suspect a watchmaker in the recent past also discovered that the balance for these watches are hard to find. Um, here is the case back. Um, so you've got some numbers on there. So um, it's Omega, Swiss made. There's one, two, five, one, which I think is a batch number. There are some watchmaker marks on the left of the case. There's a pen mark on the top of the case, so something much more recent. And then you've got 2165, which is the Omega reference. So it's a CK2165. Um, and then at the bottom is CS, and then in brackets an I, which is a little tiny mark. Uh, a little bit closer up, still quite fuzzy, it looks like that. Um, these were watches that were made for the civil service of India, which may have included quite a lot of things. Um, there are not fantastic records around this. Um, there's a bit of information online. This is a page out of uh, Conrad's book, which uh, Barak was talking about earlier. Uh, this includes some of the other CSI watches that are known to exist. So there's a few West End uh, watch companies. Uh, there are, I think, two Longines variants that are known about. There is a Tissot, um, which uh, there's one that keeps popping up on eBay at the moment. If you see it, don't buy it. It's got the wrong movement in it. Um, it's also missing the bezel, so I'm not entirely sure how the crystal's hanging on. Um, <laughs> you'll know it when you see it. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's not a whole lot of information. There's this ongoing internet argument around whether CSI stands for Civil Service of India or Canteen Services of India. The canteen Services would be the um, of the time equivalent of the Navi, or Nafi rather, so where you would go and buy things as a serving um, person overseas. Um, but the the kind of the more there's more information that suggests this is made for the civil service of India, and these would have then either been issued to British staff working in India, uh, or to Indian staff working for the Brit the British civil service in India. Because this wasn't was it the Indian civil service. Yes. So this is a point I made. So I, I made the mistake of entering a large forum argument around whether it was the civil service of India or the canteen services of India, which are the two things. And I went and looked at what those two things are. And the Indian civil service is ICS, and it's that on all the documentation. And the oh. canteen service of India is, can, um, is canteen service British Army Overseas India something. It's like got loads more letters in it. So... Who knows? So it's more likely to be crime scene. It, it could be, yeah. <laughs> it could be more closely related. To I mean, that. given all the DNA <laughs> on it. I mean. Um, so, I mean, who knows? I suspect I could try and order an extract of the archive from Omega and it would show who this was delivered to. It will probably say it was delivered to the British government. Um, yeah. There's, you can kind of dig into some interesting information around what the British civil service in India was and entrance exams and what was going on um, by sort of 1938 was the beginnings of the push for independence in India. Um, during the Second World War, the entrance exams for um, serving British civil servants who wanted to go to India, and then that was typically the route to getting a promotion and then maybe a, um, an OBE or a CBE or a, a lordship. Um, you, you'd go, uh, go to India, run a load of things, come back, be really important. Um, and that, that was sort of kind of rightfully coming to an end in the 1940s. So this serial number in this watch is, is a 9,800,000, 9, which is towards um, the 
where is it, sort of 1942, 1943. Um, and, and these are kind of some of the last of the runs. So the West End Watch Company ones tend to be a bit earlier, Longines slightly earlier than this. These are some of the last of the last. Um, as I say, 30 millimeter case, big crown, um, doesn't have fixed bars, they're just some dodgy old spring bars that are in there. Uh, I really like these small watches that were being made by the Swiss. I, I, I like them a lot and uh, I uh, I kind of don't buy into the whole like big guys can't wear small watches or the argument of I can't wear that my wrist is X. So you absolutely could wear that you just have to get over yourself and decide that you like the thing and if you like the watch wear the watch. Um, so one day this will be returned to me um, running when between James and I managed to find the correct parts hopefully from some stash of parts somewhere out there in the world um, but until then it will it will live with him. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Does anybody have any questions? Silence. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, no. Jimmy thinks that the Emmy's got great history uh, and character, very cool. Uh, Hervé says, uh, gorgeous little Emmy, now we're talking. Um, Kathleen does know why there's all that wrist cheese. She's mm. holding the case together. <laughs> The case is actually very solid, and I think there's, there's a characteristic this a characteristic this and the Ebel from earlier share is they're they're very rugged. These are designed to to be worn, um, yeah. Despite the Except fact that it's a small watch, and uh, well, the Ebel's designed to be worn. It just just doesn't look like it's been worn. It looks amazing. Yeah. <laughs> This one is Whereas filthy. this one looks like it's been lost. So. This one is filthy. I mean, uh, so I, I bought this from a guy who lives locally to me who lists a lot of very odd stuff on eBay. And um, he is from Poland originally and has been in the UK for about 25 years. And he, he says, Oh, Mateusz. Uh, I think, yes. And he said, he, yeah. he, People call him and tell him they have things. And normally he has mm. to buy like a box of stuff. Yeah. And there's some stuff that's interesting and there's some stuff that's not. And I went to see him about something else, which I ended up not buying. And he said, if you like Swiss watches, I have and pulled out like a fruit crate with, <laughs> with watches in. Um, and, and this was in there. And um, he, he told me, he's like, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it's got a broken um, staff and good luck. My watchmaker couldn't find one. And I, I just kind of, I, I saw it and I liked it. And th I think ultimately there's nothing that can't be fixed. I was talking to Seth about, um, the pocket watch that I had on that he has been working on um, and the fact this has got a broken balance stuff and he's like you know ultimately if you can't find one you can always make one yeah 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 so you can yeah. you can take a stuff from from a standard assortment and make select the closest one and makes minor uh, adjustments yeah uh, so make it more one way or another this will run again and I will wear it Fantastic. I'm looking forward to that John, Jonathan Hills agrees with you about smaller watches from the 40s, 50s, and 60s and says we should absolutely be wearing it. So that's good too. Yeah. Cool. Um, thank you, everybody. This has been great. Another, another lovely Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you to Patrick and to Barrack. And, thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you great you. honor and a pleasure. Thank you to Matt. Thank you to everybody that's joined us and given up their time this afternoon. Uh, thank you for asking interesting questions and, um, and just hanging out with us. Um, we will be doing this again next week. So keep an eye on the website, keep an eye on your emails and we will see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.